I, uh, I'm going to start off telling you uh, some work that, that we've been doing and trying to integrate it into a larger context that we can discuss in the panel session. And you'll notice that you see my photograph on the first slide here, and I've, I've come to realize that it's a common theme to put your photograph on posters uh, so people could recognize you and, and talk to you later, but it's not so common to put your picture on the, on the first slide of a talk because what's the point? You know, you're, you're seeing the guy standing there, right? But this is a nice picture because it was taken uh, at, in the John Day fossil beds in Oregon. And what I've done here is, is I'm sitting amongst uh, temporal strata where I could actually physically place myself in the history of time and in the history of life on this planet. What, what I'm going to try to do to you, for you today is put myself in the history of a very uh, unknown period of time around the time that, that life originated. And in doing so, we're going to try to uh, mesh together the artificial life approach to the origins of life and the study of the historical origins of life on the earth, the dichotomy that was made a couple of days ago, which I, which I kind of like. And I'm going to try to mesh those two together a little bit as best I can. This timeline is one that Andy Ellington um, came up with about 10 years ago that shows the, a possible sequence of molecular events leading towards modern day uh, replication machinery. And I like this because it's a, it's a proposed sequence of genetic systems starting from a very simple system leading up to a very complex system. Now we, we have no idea whether these steps in this progression are correct or not, and that's something hopefully we can discuss in our panel, but it, it at least gives us uh, a way to have a null hypothesis to test. What I'm gonna focus on today is uh, a system that's very much like this system here, which Andy calls assembly of ribozymes via tag sequences. And we have four or five ribozymes here that are in red with little green tags that may represent some, some sort of mechanism by which RNA molecules can recognize other RNA molecules. And I think another one of our panelists, Peter Unra, is going to talk about another stage in the sequence, which would be a polymerase ribozyme, which we've had discussions about uh, in the last few talks. And I think it's very interesting to think about the order in which these came, and uh, it's something we probably will never, never realize. The transition from chemistry to biology is uh, a very critical aspect of this whole meeting. And here's this definition of life um, that I, I'm just putting up there as sort of a straw man. This is this, this working definition of life. I was very careful to remove Jerry's name from this or NASA's name from this. But um, there's, there's two points I want to point out here. One is that it's a chemical system, all right? So life is a chemical system, and it's very important to not uh, disarticulate life from chemistry because they really are the same thing, just writ at different levels of, of activity. And the second thing, although the, my, under, my underline has been moved here, there's this notion of self, okay? And that's the key point I want to talk about today. What, what does it mean to be self? For, for, from a chemical point of view to a chemist, we often think about autocatalysis as a key feature of life. And of course, autocatalysis is where the product of a reaction feeds back and catalyzes its own synthesis. Okay, it's a very common thing that we see in living systems and in chemical emulations of living systems. But here's an autocatalytic reaction where we take permanganate and react it with oxalate in the presence of acid, and we produce manganous ion and carbon dioxide in water. Now, if you add manganous ion to this, to this reaction, it will feed back and speed up the rate of its own synthesis from permanganate. But is this alive? Clearly, this is not a living system. The only thing that really happens of interest here is that the solution changes color. All right, but it's, it's not alive. It's not going to run around and uh, do interesting things. So we have, to, we have to be careful here that autocatalysis is a necessary condition for life, but it's not a su sufficient condition for life. So that's the chemical nature. I'm going to focus now on the selfish nature. Every, every definition of life that I've ever seen has some indication of self-replication or self this or self that. What does it mean to be a self? So that diagram I showed you on the previous slide is, is where one molecule catalyzes its own 
reproduction, okay, or its own synthesis. And I would describe that as a very selfish reaction. But I'm more interested in systems that look like this, where you have one reaction and another reaction, and they may actually be cross-catalytic. And we saw an excellent example of that um, a couple of days ago in Jerry Joyce's talk, where we, we saw that lig ligation, ligase ribozymes could be cross-catalytic. And I would like to describe this type of a system as cooperative. All right, and I want to draw your attention to this notion of cooperation because I think it's very important to think about it in terms of early life and in synthetic life. Another, another concept that I'm, I'm sort of heralding here is the notion of recombination. And recombination is the shuffling of large blocks of genetic information from one source to another. And on this slide, I'm, I'm juxtaposing recombination on the left with polymerization on the right. And they're both ways of making longer polymers from shorter polymers or monomers. But recombination is a very distinct method where we get a long polymer from shorter polymers in a single step, OK, in a single energy neutral step. And you should note here that we have a small polymer that may not be of interest and may be lost to evolution. But I'm not too concerned about that because evolution really only focuses on the winners over time and not the losers. So in thinking about recombination as a potential uh, player in the origins of life, I went in the laboratory a few years back and designed an RNA molecule that could recombine other RNA molecules, the so-called generalized RNA recombinase. And we used a group one intron ribozyme to, to perform this reaction. I'm not going to go through all the details of this, but this gray molecule here is a recombinase ribozyme, and it can recombine blue molecules and red molecules to produce chimeric red blue molecules in, in a very short uh, reaction scheme. Here's the recombinase ribozyme that we found is the most efficient and the one we focused our studies on. It's the group one intron from the purple bacterium Azoarchus. It's, a, uh, it's an intron in the isoleucyl tRNA of this, this bacterial species and it's about 200 nucleotides long and it excises itself from a nascent tRNA transcript through transesterification reactions, which are essentially recombination reactions. So we engineered this molecule to be a generalized recombinase. And what we did is we focused on the fact that it has an internal guide sequence at its five prime end, in this case you see a GUG, and that it can recognize a specific sequence in another molecule, which is its complement, and in this case you can see it's CAU. And so we have an internal guide sequence and a complement. And to me, this looks a lot like Andy Ellington's tag. All right, so there's a very short tag sequence at the end of this molecule. What we did is we took this molecule and we broke it up into four pieces. This is a 200 nucleotide molecule. We broke it up into four pieces that we called W, X, Y, and Z for simplicity. They're each about 50 nucleotides in length. And what we did is we designed a scheme where if we take these four molecules separately, throw them in a single test tube with some salt, walk away, have lunch, and come back, we find that these molecules spontaneously self-assemble themselves into the full-length molecule through a series of recombination reactions. And here is a, here's a gel image of this, of this uh, sequence of events starting with the reaction, starting with the molecule W, we get WX, WXY, and finally WXYZ as a function of time. And of course, if you leave out any one of the four fragments, you get no reaction at all. So we call this self-assembly via recombination, or more specifically, covalent self-assembly via recombination. This actually happens in a two-step process. All right, this, this slide shows these four fragments, uh, where is it, W, X, Y, and Z that we throw into the test tube. They come together to form a trans complex, what we call a trans complex through hydrogen bonding interactions, specific hydrogen bonding interactions to form a version of the ribozyme that's not covalently, not covalently contiguous. But this version of the molecule has a certain amount of residual activity and can perform recombination reactions, and this thing can start recombining these molecules two at a time until it forms a covalent version of the molecule, which then, through autocatalytic feedback, can perform the same sort of reaction on the initial uh, oligos and perform um, the synthesis of more of itself. And this happens faster and faster as time goes on until you run out of, out of reactants. 
So this is really what I'm calling building a self, and again, this goes back to the definition of self, building a self from smaller pieces. So here, this is the self, but before, these were selves, maybe, but I'd like to think of these four molecules cooperating to build this molecule, which is a self, all right? So cooperation probably had uh, sort of an earlier, in my view, role in the origins of life. But here what we did is we took four highly engineered molecules, four very specific sequences, and threw them in a test tube um, with the advantage of knowing what they might do. But in the origin of life, we had a whole series of molecules floating around in whatever milieu that might have been there. Maybe it was a, maybe it was a warm little pond, maybe it was a, a membrane enclosed vesicle, maybe it was cracks in a deep sea hydrothermal vent, we don't know. But nevertheless, it was a very complicated environment. And so I would like to take this system and throw it, throw it a little curveball to ask what would happen if these molecules were forced to participate in some sort of reaction network, the kind of network that was envisioned by Eigen and Schuster in the 1970s. And so what I want to try to do is extend this cooperation beyond four molecules and into a network of molecules and see what would happen. I this simple, very simple network scheme to see if we could take advantage of the self-assembly of these molecules in a more, even more cooperative fashion. And here what we did is we created three little sub-cycles, I1, I2, and I3, and in each one of these, Instead of breaking the WXYZ molecule into four fragments, we broke them into two fragments, but in three different ways. So we have W and XYZ, we have WX and YZ, and we have WXY and Z. And then we did something really dastardly, okay, whoops, uh-uh, uh-oh. We did something really dastardly. What we did is we took the guide sequence and made it mismatch with the tag so that each one of these component cycles, sub-cycles, should not be able to assemble themselves. So that this on its own can't assemble itself, nor can this, nor can that. But we designed it such that the products of this, E1, could assemble I2, and so on and so forth around the cycle. So by mismatching the tags and the guide sequences, we are forcing them to cooperate. And this is the uh, sort of the empirical data that we see from one of these runs, we've done many such experiments. And here's an example where we're following the, the yield of WXYZ as a function of time. And we can see that if we just have one of these little subsystems by itself, there's not a lot of reaction. We put in two, we get more reaction. We put in all three, we get a, a lot more reaction. So there's, there's a, a strong hint of cooperativity here. This is a slide where we track the genotypic frequencies of the three E1, E2, and E3 ribozymes as a function of time. All right, this is a three-dimensional plot. Uh, it's called a simplex plot where we're tracking the composite frequencies of E1, E2, and E3 as a, as a point on this plot. And we're tracking the frequency change as a function of time from, say, 30 minutes up to 16 hours or five minutes up to six hours. Okay? Every time we do this reaction, we see it starts the... the, the the concentrations, the frequencies start somewhere in the middle because we start with equal molar ratios and they all migrate to this corner of the diagram, all right? Now, I really like this plot. I really like this, this depiction because it shows a very rudimentary form of evolution if you define evolution as changes in genotypic frequencies as a function of time. A lot of people have told me, uh, you know, I don't really like this plot. It doesn't really show very much but I'm very attracted to it because it shows that in a very simple system we can have a rudimentary form of evolution and there's an attractor over here. It's not on the edge, but it's somewhere in the internal region, an attractor where every time we do the reaction, the system is attracted to that point. So to me, this shows that there is a certain amount of complexity or uh, evolutionary drive that's driven by a thermodynamic property of these molecules, namely that E2 is the best synthesizer that drives it to a, a very uh, common endpoint, which gives me hope about cooperativity in a network system giving you order out of chaos. And so this is the last piece of data I want to show you. Uh, we asked the question, okay, is it better to be cooperative or is it better to be selfish? And the cooperative system 
Uh, this is one of those plots I showed you here, I, I1 plus I2 and I3. But then we made a second system, this red line, where we made each of the three subsystems selfish so that the tag and the guide sequence matched so that they could self-assemble. And as you might expect, it was kind of disappointing to see that the selfish systems outcompete the cooperative systems over, over the, the time course of the, ex, of the experiment. All right, that was sort of a downer because I wanted to see that uh, it's good to be cooperative, right? But then we decided, well, what if we threw all of these molecules in the same reaction milieu, and when we do that, we have a reversal of fortune, okay? So these bold lines are when we throw all 12 fragments, all six of H1, the cooperative system, and all six of S1 in the same test tube, and here, cooperation beats out selfishness, all right? So this is an experimental system. The question is, this, is this a general result? So to, to do that, oops, skipped ahead. To do that, we, uh, we collaborated with Irene Chen and Michael Manipat, who are modelers, and they could take the parameters of this system and model it. And when they do that, they find the same general result, okay, the same order of events, where cooperation alone is beat out by selfishness alone, but when everything's mixed together, the cooperative system can outcompete the selfish system. It's not a huge advantage, but I suspect that over evolutionary time, it could be uh, levied into a much greater uh, uh, de desired result. So putting this all together, okay, uh, in, a, in a literal and a figur figurative sense, we've discovered that group one introns can be engineered to be general recombinases. We've discovered that the Azoarchus ribozyme in particular can self-assemble self itself through recombination, and that a highly cooperative network of RNA molecules, solely of RNA molecules, could be comprised from this system, all right? So the take-home message is recombination is powerful, cooperation is good, thank goodness, and the systems chemistry approach, again, it comes up time and time again as a, as a, as a useful approach here, okay? So here's our timeline again, starting from simple molecules up to the complex molecules, recombination, polymerization, but it's possible that this could be inverted, okay? And with that, I'm going to leave up the acknowledgement slides. I have a lot of people to acknowledge, and I want to thank you for your attention.